Hello, everyone. Good morning to some and good afternoon to others. But thank you all for being here with us. And a special thank you to Michael Ziegler for taking the time to share the value of Locus and how it facilitates life as an attorney. Michael, I'm here. If you need any assistance, I will pass it on to you now. Very cool. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're all doing awesome. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Mike Ziegler. Uh, I'm a practicing attorney in Clearwater. Our focus uh, or our, our practice focuses on bankruptcy, debt defense, and collection harassment claims under FDCPA and laws like that. Uh, so let me start by saying why the heck I'm doing this. So, um, so I, I don't get any sort of um, uh, monetary relationship with Locus, except that I pay them, just like all of you. Uh, but I'm I'm a big believer in uh, what what I see that Locus enables us to do. You know, and my my philosophy as the manager of our practice is that this is kind of a new way of practicing law. The expectations of our clients are higher than they've ever been. The amount of information they want about how their case is going is higher than it's ever been. And really what I think is so awesome about Locus and the Locus community is that everyone that I've seen through the Facebook group and otherwise is really kind of committed to elevating their practice to be able to answer that call. And at least for me, the way that I see the best way we can do that is uh, as a group effort by elevating our, our way of using the software by working hand in hand with Harry and his team in being able to provide the best client experience possible. So my, my perception is if I can help you all do things a little bit better, that probably means that at some point you're going to find some cool things to do that I haven't thought of. And I would certainly welcome um, kind of the mutuality of that. So, uh, so I, I have kind of a few topics I'm going to go through here. Uh, and I really want to encourage everyone to kind of keep this conversational. I mean, I, I probably have maybe uh, it, and it looks like in quick question, it looks like question on the recording. I imagine that that Harry and team will um, be thrilled to be able to post this and make this available after the fact. Uh, so definitely keep this conversational. I'm going to be hitting on a few different points. Uh, and, you know, we have certain ways that we use the software. We've been participants in um, Locus and First, I guess I should ask, can, every, can everybody hear me? I should really start with the obvious stuff. I can hear you perfectly, Michael. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, thumbs up, awesome, cool. So I'm gonna be going through a few different ways that we use the software. We've been software users for about a year and a half. And as, um, as the Locus team have rolled out certain developments, we have not adopted all of them just because we kind of already had a way that worked. So I, I'm going to kind of open the floor up periodically. And if you all are doing things differently, then I really encourage you to contribute that. And uh, there's always kind of different ways of solving the same problem. Um, all right. So let me start with just kind of the basics of workflow design. And let me figure out where the heck I put uh, the window and I'm going to try to share a screen here and hopefully this will work uh, exactly as I planned. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Ziegler. Yes, sir. Hi, may I ask a question, please? Go right ahead. Rock and roll. I didn't understand. I didn't understand your last the last sentence you said some you're rolling out features that you didn't adopt, but some people have already done or are doing it their own way. What does that mean? Sure. So for example, like the client portal within Locus that came out relatively recently and we don't use that. Not that it isn't valuable. It's just that we kind of already had our workflows set up and didn't incorporate that into our workflow. So so I guess it's just another way of saying there are multiple ways to do things, some of which are in Locus and we're not always using Locus uh, to, as, as the solution to our problem, but that doesn't mean that there aren't Locus solutions. Is that fair? Yes. Uh, could you 
tell me uh, offline the other solutions that you use sometimes just out of curiosity because uh, I'm looking for a solution. I'm a solution hunter and gatherer type. So <laughs> 100%. And, and, I'll, and, and if you don't mind, I'm kind of going to table that. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure no, out. No, no, no. So in other words, you're, you're not going to speak on issues that you don't use Locus for, right? Yes, correct. Correct. Gotcha. Thanks. And real quick, are you guys seeing the screen that has my Zoom window or are you seeing the screen that has Lucid chart? Zoom window. Zoom Perfect. Window. Okay. All right. So step one is workflow design. So uh, going to, and, and maybe kind of um, seg great, great segue. So here is one of the tools that we use that at least I am particularly fond of. Uh, so um, Lucidchart is just a workflow designer. There is a free version, which is what we use. And I really recommend that you start here, um, or a lot of times I've seen someone in the Facebook uh, group ask, how long can I expect to have all my workflows done? And my answer to that is, you know, if you're doing it right, then probably never because you'll set them up and then you'll go back every X, you know, as you're using them or every maybe, you know, six months or a year and kind of iterate how you're doing this. You know, you'll find that clients respond better to some communications than others or whatever. So it's, it's an iterative process. You do it once and then you find a way of doing it better. So this is kind of a good way of simplifying the thought process for how you're developing your workflows. Uh, and so I put together just kind of a really rough sample. Um, and for, uh, for me in terms of, and I'm gonna go through at least just kind of a couple of my design philosophies on workflows. So first, you know, kind of intuitive, it starts with your basics. What are your stages gonna be? Breaking your case up into its different component parts and then kind of building out the different things that happen in each component part. Um, through, at least through my experience, I've found a couple of patterns or, or kind of tips that have helped to, I, I think, make my workflows a little bit more effective. First, uh, it, maybe it's kind of obvious, but your first step should be some kind of an onboarding stage. Uh, in that stage, you want to make sure to um, uh, address whatever your payment issues are. You want to have your hello and onboarding information generated over to your client. Uh, this is a great place. I, I'm a big fan of Locus's intake forms. Uh, and I'll expand on that a little bit more a little bit later. Um, most of this information, you know, unless you're a true, true solo, you know, these are great tasks for an admin. So going, so if you're uh, in a litigation oriented practice, going into your docket and saving down all of your dockets, or excuse me, all your documents, um, adding your related parties, these are all great things to be doing in your first stage. Uh, I made a note here, as you're thinking through your different steps, what is really important is you want to notate uh, who is responsible for the step and how to get to your next step. So as you're going through and building out these steps, what I usually do is uh, after I kind of identify what's happening, I'll identify who's responsible for the step. So I would type in here paralegal. Um, you know, uh, billing person and, and so forth. And this is, this is a great way of just visualizing from the top down what your client journey looks like. Um, let's see a couple, uh, this is also kind of a good way of just making sure that you have good staffing balance. So if you kind of go through this whole thing, you realize that you have one person that is doing disproportionately more. This is a great way of getting this in balance. 
Uh, by using a workflow designer, what I find this is particularly helpful for is as a training tool. So as I'm onboarding new staff, usually I'm not walking them through uh, the individual tasks that happen in Locus. Usually I'm using this as kind of my primary training tool to kind of explain them, explain to them what happens in each stage of a case. Um, in, in terms of your hello email to the client, and I, I had all these notes and I'm losing where the heck they went to, but um, first, for, your, for any communication, so in almost every stage of your case, uh, as the case moves from stage to stage, you're probably gonna have a communication to your client. Uh, a couple of notes on that. First, in terms of what you're including, you're including what's happening in the case. So of course, in your first stage, it's kind of the onboarding, hi, welcome to the firm, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a great place to have a Q&A. So if you find, particularly at each stage, that you have a few really common questions that come from your clients, this is the great place to get ahead of that and answer them. Um, very importantly, in the, the emails that come, come out at each stage to the client is who to contact about solving their problems. So that's important in two respects. First of all, the email probably should be uh, automatically generated from the person that they should be responding to. So usually, again, unless you're a true solo, this email should not be coming out from kind of the, the managing partner. This should be coming out from whoever's responsible for this particular stage. Likewise, there should be a note in there, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Client, if you have questions, here's who you should direct them to. So kind of get, give them it empowered your clients to be able to ask questions to the right the right people. Some other important utilizations for your your autogen emails is, uh, and this kind of goes hand in hand with your forms. This is a good opportunity to cross sell, as as that term is used in other industries. Meaning, uh, usually we send out forms early on that, in addition to gathering data that's specific for the case. We might say, hey, have you also been experiencing these three other problems? And this way, if they have been experiencing those other problems, we may be able to assist those in, in those other, other directions. That's a win for the client and hopefully a win for the law firm. Um, as you get further into the client experience, as you get later into your stages, these are also ways of automatically capturing reviews for, for your firm. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, did we just do an awesome job getting a discharge in your bankruptcy? Would really welcome your feedback. Here's some stuff you can click on. Um, so after you, so, so of course you'll kind of go on through the client experience uh, in, um, in many practice areas the next step in the process is going to be to gather information from your clients. Sometimes that information is relatively more uh, straightforward. Sometimes the information you're gathering is relatively more complex. So uh, kind of using our firm as an example in our debt defense cases, the, the data that we're gathering is not super sophisticated. There, there are a few documents that we request and the Q&A that we get from the intake form. By contrast, in our bankruptcy process, the documents that we're gathering are a lot more complex. And so we have, so in, in the former example, we just include our document requests in this initial settlement process be, because it's a little bit more straightforward. Whereas in our bankruptcy case uh, cases, document collection is its own stage. Um, at least for us, uh, and again, this is kind of where, well, actually, I'll tell you what, before, before I flip over to that, let me kind of open up the floor. And uh, as with every attorney, I'm good at talking and, and have to kick myself in the butt to listen. Uh, is anyone doing anything differently on their onboarding stage that they think is really valuable? 
So, so I'll kind of keep, keep rolling here. And, and I guess my game plan is, you know, I'll, I'll kind of uh, keep blabbing for the next few minutes and, uh, and we'll certainly welcome any comments during my discussion. Then I'll, I'll really just kind of uh, put the floor wide open for general Q and A, even if it's not specifically related to anything that I've said at the end. So uh, um, uh, think about your best questions. Okay. Uh, so, so in that document collection process um, for my more intense, and this this probably is pretty similar for um, those of you out there that do estate planning, or you know there, there are other areas that are are very document intensive. But again, I have my own stage specifically for doc collection, uh, and then at least for bankruptcy, what we do is. Our onboarding stage is also kind of our payment plan stage. And for clients that want to break their payment up into installments, we just kind of keep them in a payment plan stage and just let them know, hey, we're not going to start collecting your documents until that, that payment is complete. Um, so at least within document collection, uh, if it's q and I'm, I'm a big fan of Locus's intake forms. If it's um, relatively straightforward document requests and, 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 and I would almost say document documents that are suggested, but maybe not required to advance the case. Then for me, I'm totally good with Locus's um, uh, intake forms to collect them. Just a quick aside on that. I, I do really recommend a secondary workflow for when the intake form comes back to alert people that the intake form has, has come back and to save it down and take action on it. Uh, at least for us, if we have more sophisticated doc collection, then we use a software called File. File invite is Zapier friendly and I'll uh, add some information towards the, uh, in a different section of the discussion on how to connect up File invite with Locus. Uh, so file invite, uh, and not, not to plug them too much, but they're, they're just a very smooth document collection software where they send out reminders. They have an internal review process uh, and they set deadlines for when the documents can um, uh, be returned by and they add kind of descriptive fields and attachments and stuff. So again, that's one of those things that we got into a few years back and have just been, been comfortable with. Um, All right, so that's your document collection stage. Uh, you know, from there, your stages are really going to vary depending on what type of case that you have. If it's a litigation oriented case, probably you'll have, you know, if you're on the defense side, you might have some standardized or, or at least starting places for maybe early motions, or you might have a list of first day motions or notices that go out you probably will have a discovery stage, either sending uh, and potentially responding to discovery. Uh, you might have a dispositive motion stage and, and kind of so on down the line. Um, with bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy uh, in particularly chapter sevens are usually pretty linear where after you've collected your documents, you're drafting your petition, filing, you have your 341 prep, uh, and then post 341 issues. And so you would take each of those different parts and break them out into different steps. And, and largely what you're including in each step is pretty close to what you see here, meaning you're updating your client either with text or with emails uh, and maybe with an auto-generated letter. Um, you might be collecting some information from the client. Uh, where possible, if you have some standard documents, then you want to auto-generate at least your starting points for those uh, and then set up your tasks. And, and the tasks are, you know, arguably that most important part where in each ta task, you want to be very clear who is responsible, how do you get to your next step, and whether that's a micro step like a task or whether that's a major step like a, a stage you wanna make sure that that full 
that, that that clarity is in each step that you're taking. So I wanted to, so let me take my breather there. Uh, any questions or comments so far? Michael, there is a question um, in the chat section here. It says, how do you instigate a secondary workflow and use it in conjunction with the primary workflow? Um, great question, at least with respect to the intake form workflow. Uh, so there is a trigger for intake form returned. And so, uh, so instead of your trigger being stage change, you would, you would just have, I, I mean, I guess, depending on the circumstance, you'd just have a separate trigger. And in this case, because intake form returned has its own trigger, then, then that's, that's kind of the methodology to, to get there. And uh, let's see, ah, here we are. So I wanted to give you an idea of what I put into my tasks. So kind of, you, you wanna think of your, your task set up as a combination of your to-do list, but also kind of a little bit of a, um, like a self-training tool. So here, this is kind of an example task. Uh, um, I, I assign, you know, what the name of the task is. This is from like a, uh, a step one, like a setup stage. Uh, and, Within the task we use, so there, there's, I'm sure about a thousand different um, webcam recording tools out there. And so what I at least try to do is that for each stage, I'll just make a quick recording of um, how to accomplish the task. And then I'll build out exactly what is supposed to be done in the task. And so this is just a, a setup task fill in the fields, we identify which fields to fill in and how to get the information. Um, I assign who that's done to. And then of course, this is gonna be really valuable down the line because by having these fields complete, it's gonna be a lot easier for us to uh, auto-generate our documents. But this is kind of the type of philosophy that we include in all the tasks that we create where there should be some pretty clean checklist type information for how to complete the task and then enough educational information for, you know, if someone's coming in, they're relatively green, they're saying, no, I'm not really sure how to access this information, then they really have the ability to do that themselves. And this way they can kind of work more independently. Uh, as you get to your end, generally for your final stage, you're gonna want like a debriefing stage. So in your debriefing stage, usually that's going to be, uh, I, I, uh, as, as I was self-educating on management, I, I heard a expression that I've really hung on to, which is called your hero moments. Uh, you want to kind of really kind of celebrate that hero moment with the client and say, hey, client, you have accomplished so much. We have taken X numbers, X number of dollars in debt, and we got a discharge order from the court and your case is now complete and your, your, your life has started anew or you know, whatever, whatever it is that um, you know, was the aspiration of the client, hopefully when, when they signed with you that you've accomplished with them, you, know, you, you wanna recognize that and, and tell them that that is a moment to, uh, to celebrate. Uh, you wanna use that as an opportunity to, um, sales is a dirty word in, in the legal industry, but kind of to sell, meaning, hey, client, you know, just, you know, if you have other folks that are in trouble, I would certainly welcome uh, you directing them to us. If you feel like we've done a great job, uh, we would really appreciate your, your feedback online. And do you have any other issues that we can help you out with? So those are kind of key opportunities and things that you want to be capturing um, towards the end and, and arguably in maybe not arguably, but probably in other parts of the representation as well. Um, but definitely don't, don't lose track of those opportunities. Um, 
All right. I wanted to give a little bit of insight into Zapier use. So, so again, we, we've kind of had a little bit more time than I think most users to really kind of understand how to kind of um, really kind of maximize what we're doing from within Locus. And definitely using the workflows is most of that. But I, the more comfortable you get with Zapier, the more you'll find that you can kind of take Locus to a whole nother level. I would say probably the most valuable way to use Zapier is going to be for lead capture. And uh, if anyone on this is not already a member of the Facebook group, I encourage you to join. And there was kind of an extended dialogue in there where I was able to include screenshots for adding leads uh, from Calendly into Locus. Uh, and that's I, uh, I'm kind of going to refer you over there if that's something that you're you're interested in, just because it's it's really difficult for me to post screenshots one screen at a time uh, while filtering out client data on the video. Um, but any anything that you are doing that creates leads that has any um, consistency to it, so meaning if you get a web form, if you get um, an email from a lead service, if you have uh, a chat service that sends you um, formatted information about people that, that call you, that can almost always be turned, uh, be kind of captured with a zap and put directly into Locus as a lead. Um, so, so where that would not work is if you had someone who just kind of sent you a like truly typewritten email. Hey, you know, Mr. Attorney Smith, I, I, I was referred to you by my, my sister and she said that you might be able to help me with this problem. That would be very difficult to turn into a zap uh, from a lead, but uh, almost anything that's form-based, you can add directly into Locus leads. And that's where you kind of take advantage of Locus's automated systems to help augment what you're able to do to communicate with that client by maybe sending out a text message or an email, hey, thanks so much for getting in touch with us. Um, so that, that to me is probably the highest value use of Zapier. But another example I, I wanted to give you, and I, I mentioned it earlier, is uh, at least this is kind of an example of an in um, uh, kind of, uh, an, an active case use of Zapier. So here, and, and I hope you all will forgive me, but I can't open up all this stuff up because there's live client data in there, but I can kind of give you an overview. And if anyone wants to follow up with me after the, the video, I can uh, hopefully expand a little bit more. But, but to just kind of narrate what we're doing. So um, we start off and we say, okay, this is a matter within Locus that has moved to our document collection stage. We then use the Zap to find a client because the, the output in the matter move to section doesn't give you all, all of the data points for um, the contact information, meaning when you go here, you're uh, you won't be able to utilize the the email from the client. You're just going to get some more ba some pretty basic information about the matter. So if I want to manipulate the email address or the phone number, you need a find contact action. Uh, from there, within file invite, um, uh, we first kind of create a contact. And here's where I kind of got a little bit flashy. So at least with the way that we handle bankruptcies, for most of our cases, we ask that clients that want to be filed within a given month, send us the documents for drafting by the fifth of the month. Uh, and there's the zap that creates a invite um, doesn't have a way of setting a particular date of the month. It just, you, we can only create number of days from when the zap was set out. So we could send out an invite and say, this is due in one week, but not that it's due by the fifth of the month. So I kind of got flashy and I created an additional zap that went into Google Sheets. And I said, Google Sheets, tell me how many days between today 
and the fifth of the next month. And that was kind of a two-step process. Google Sheets spits that out and it says, hey, Mike, there's 15 days between today and the fifth of the month. And then when we create the request within file invite, we plug in the output from Google Sheets to say, send a request 15 days out. This last step is pretty important for almost anything you do within Zapier. And that is to create a note within Locus that some sort of automation has occurred. And that's, that's really, I think, a, a valuable way of kind of communicating internally and saying, hey team, just so you know, uh, Zapier has done some stuff on the back end. So just be aware that that has happened through automation. And this way, as you're kind of, uh, you know, part of the reality of setting up a lot of these, inf these automations is that it is a lot of testing. And, you know, sometimes things don't, in fact, probably more often than not, uh, the first few times you do this, it's not going to go the way that you envision it's going to go. Uh, so you, you kind of have to keep markers out there to understand how to, um, how things happened. And, and it keeps accountability, keeps kind of people in the know when things have happened automatically. So that's kind of, that, that's an example of what we've done in this app. Uh, I, I guess, likewise, in terms of just um, teachable tricks, for, uh, tricks, I, I don't know if that's the right word, but, uh, but, I, but this is from the Calendly Zap that I mentioned in the Facebook group. So, so the idea of the Calendly Zap is that if a new appointment is created within Calendly that has a specific name, so, so meaning a Calendly appointment for a consultation as opposed to a calendar appointment for a follow-up meeting with an existing client. So we, we say, all right, new appointments created in Calendly. Step two, make sure that it is a Calendly appointment that is for a new client. And then we include a, um, uh, a filter part of, and, and then we kind of extract the data from Calendly so that we're, we're prepared to put it into um, Locus, but before we put it in, we add a filter that says, if you already see a potential client who has this name, then don't add it. If and, and this way you don't get a bunch of data redundancies. So those are the types of thought processes that I recommend having as you're starting to add these zaps. Um, but at the end of the day, don't don't you know? Uh, action is better than inaction. Don't get too sidetracked on the ways of polishing these. Start with something and it, it will improve. Um, oh, just a quick, uh, quick note and I'll hopefully, uh, maybe I'll be able to figure this out, maybe not. All right, let me pause in there for just a moment. Uh, I know we just covered a whole bunch of stuff, questions, comments. Oh, I see a few um, questions, sorry. They weren't really visible as I was, as I was chatting. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'll, I'll kind of plug through some of these questions. Um, uh, Ronald, sorry, I'm not really familiar with Moxtra. It could, so it's hard for me to compare. Uh, and if anyone else is familiar with comparing the Locus client platform to Moxtra, um, please feel free to jump in and uh, give us some insight on that. Um, and I think we spoke to the secondary workflow I do have a promo code for file invite, which I'll post into the chat. Uh, just full transparency, they give me the, the um, stunning benefit of $20 per use, but uh, if you guys use the promo code and it gives you 20% off for three months, um, so just full disclosure on that, but it is a good platform. Um, I think that that's really kind of most of what I had to cover. Does anyone have any questions, any ways that they're using Locus that is smarter than um, 
what what I'm doing are just different. Let me let me break this down. Just uh, I don't know if we can do a, a vote, but um, in terms of practice areas, is there a way to to raise hands? Maybe uh, any other bankruptcy practitioners in the group? We do have a question, Michael, um, oh, in the chat. Okay. How and when do you collect funds during onboarding? So great question. Um, and, and I'll say, you know, I, I, I'm here as a teacher, but, I, but in reality, I'm just as much a student as everybody else, always kind of searching for ways of kind of getting our stuff to, to work cleaner. So at least for us, we don't convert to a client until after we get at least a deposit, even if it's not full deposit. So for us, uh, after... Uh, you know, during, during, of course, the, the lead process, we send out a representation agreement and assuming it's not a contingency representation, then we, we ask for some sort of payment. And it's really at that, in, in most instances, at that time that they've sent back some sort of um, approval for a deposit that, uh, that, we're, that, that we convert to um, a client. For our bankruptcy clients, we do offer installment plans. We do not, anyone who's a bankruptcy practitioner may be familiar with the, the concept of, of bifurcated representation or zero down representation. We don't do that. And that's a kind of different discussion, but just from a, a, um, a billing perspective, we offer payment plans, but we ask that the payment plan be completed until we move to that next stage of document collection. Um, for the other services that we offer, and usually they have to be paid full upfront unless they're a contingency representation. Uh, and then we use, um, uh, mostly we use law pay for payment processing. I, I'd say, so in terms of lock is functionality that probably I'm, I'm weak on is their invoicing system and, and. Harry, if you if you want to uh, supplement anything that I'm saying, please feel feel welcome to. Uh, but I would say there's probably opportunity for us to grow and being smoother and sending out invoices and collecting on them. A couple of points that that I'm gonna kind of um, pick up the baton on from from Trey. So first, for for those of you that that are really new to setting up your your systems. Uh, my my best advice to you is don't overcomplicate your process. Like like I said at the beginning, this isn't a situation where you're going to get everything right uh, right off the bat. Your your best way to go is uh, um, get your fundamentals in place, get your basics in place. You know, just kind of create your priorities for your first couple of months. Hey, you know, priority number one is just to break it up into stages and do this. Uh, and then, you know, three months out, you can revisit it and you can all, you can always supplement what you do and you're going to, but don't overwhelm yourself by trying to get it all done perfectly the first time out. Uh, I think the other point uh, that I'm going to kind of steal uh, from, I think, uh, maybe uh, from Mario, maybe, and is uh, me maybe taking advantage of having this podium for maybe some good items to keep on the wish list for Locus because billing is one of the most important things we do. I think Locus has some great fundamentals in there, but there also probably is room for growth in terms of um, payment plans and uh, payment follow-ups and, and some of those automations, I, I think probably it, it wouldn't be too. And, and that's that's one thing I have to really kind of tip the cap on to the Locus team is that they're incredibly receptive to feedback from all of us um, when there are things that that they see can kind of make our lives easier. They they listen and um, and it, you know the 
the feature you request might not be there the next day, it might not be there the next month, but they're they're pretty good about listening and and continuing to develop the product. Uh, you know, we're um, we have the benefit of being maybe a medium sized firm, so we have someone who's kind of focused on billing, and that allows us to kind of ebb and flow. Um, I, I think uh, law pay is and and their their ways of integrating into the billing statements is a great start. Uh, but um, but definitely there are opportunities for automation and, and better kind of payment options that that could be grown, I suppose. Um, cool. I'm I'm seeing I'm just kind of scanning some um, some other comments in uh, the chat, and I, I see a few folks that are volunteering to uh, really kind of invest in in community in terms of sharing different workflows, which I think is awesome. You know, I'm. I'm definitely of the mindset that we grow together. So thank you all for those, those comments. Um, uh, from Deanna, and I, I guess just to pass this on to the face, or excuse me, the, um, the Locus folks, I, I think that's uh, a, a good wish list item is kind of just some preset pipelines for the beginners so that they have a sense of comfort of at least more or less the way that um, workflows work. I think that's, um, I, I think, a fair uh, request. And, and maybe just a recommendation to anyone out there. I think, you know, if you're not already a participant in the Facebook group, by and large, I think if you put yourself out there and say, hey, I practice in this area, is there anyone that can set aside 30 or 45 minutes for a screen share to just kind of see what you're doing? I I would imagine you would probably get um, pretty good feedback on that. You know, it's it's a little bit tough in a recorded forum, um, but I, I think probably you'd have good receptivity to that. Uh, and and I see Nate reaching out, uh, anyone who does IP work, um, uh, he's in the chats, please feel welcome to connect. So I'm, I'm Running out of blab, uh, very happy to answer any questions uh, if anyone has any. Um, uh, Harry, Ar Ariana, if you if you want to add anything, please feel welcome to do so. Thank you, Michael, and thank you everyone for the feedback. We are definitely taking it into consideration as we do always want to improve Locus for you guys. Um, I do see one question. I don't know if you answered this, Michael. It says, how does your firm send invoice reminders? Not sure if that was covered already. I believe that is our last question. So that that's kind of a work in progress where we are kind of maybe hunting for a way to augment the way that we offer payment options. And uh, so I, I guess my answer is I'm not sure quite yet. Right now we do have a person that supervises the payments and she can she can kind of review who's in payment plans and follow up with them. But we could stand for a way to do that better. And then one more question. What does your onboarding pipeline look like? Uh, so, well, it depends on practice area. So our leads pipeline, of course, is different than our onboarding pipeline. Within our leads pipeline, and forgive me, I can't show the live data because it has a bunch of client names in there. But um, so at least within our leads pipeline, we have, and, and, and I'll kind of verbalize as best as I can. We have one stage that we list as our prospect stage for folks that are not yet scheduled. We then have a second stage for folks that, so, so if someone comes in and I talked a little bit about the Calendly integration earlier, if they've already scheduled, they wouldn't go into that first step because they've already scheduled. They would then go into our second step, which is someone who's scheduled. Uh, which is kind of the consultation pending. Um, from there, if if it's clearly just not, if we're not a match for each other, then of course we would just um, not engage the, the potential client. But then if they have not yet retained us, then we have two separate stages, one for people that um, have requested a representation agreement pending, and then, um, uh, and then a, a fourth stage for folks that have not yet get requested a representation agreement, um, but they're still 
viable. They may still be a, a good match for us. They just haven't requested an agreement. So those are kind of our basic stages. Um, we do have a fifth stage for cases where we just have to investigate the matter further. So particularly for our collection harassment cases, uh, we do we perform a pre-suit investigation for those cases just to make sure the claim is viable. And so that's kind of like a separate stage. Um, so those are our intake stages. Now that's a little bit different than onboarding. At least my, my perspective on onboarding is that's kind of loading in the client data and the data about their case and so forth. And that's pretty much going to be stage one in every one of our, our workflows. So I hope that that gives at least some, some sense of it. Uh, two practice areas. How do you use Um, great question from, uh, is it Diana? It, forgive me if I've, I've mispronounced that, but, um, Danya. Uh, so how would you distinguish leads for different practice areas? So I'll say we kind of have the benefit of enough commonality between leads from each of our practice areas that we really don't have to separate them. I think if we had two clearly different types of leads, if we had two really distinguished practice areas, I think there's probably a few different ways that you could handle that. First, you could have all the leads coming in initially into one stage and then separate them out into two separate stages. That would be one possibility. Uh, another possibility would be um, using tags or color codes to separate out your leads. And this way, they're, they're visually a little bit different and you can use filters so that you're just looking at one set of leads at a time. So just some, I, I guess, some thoughts in there. I believe that is all our questions. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone. If you guys want to take a look at the comments, we do have a few attorneys offering to share their workflows and what they've built. So please take a look at that. And once again, thank you so much, Michael, for your time. You got it. Thanks, everybody. Best wishes. Thank you, everyone, for attending.